welcome to the Car Sim and Race Driver Show, presented by Hugh Hattrick. Here at Bathurst in the course, my very special guest, Peter Golly, Rascal Rabbit, Josh Martin. It's great to have you back on the show. Drive fast and try not to crash. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Car Sim and Race Driver Show. It may be February, it may even be snowing wherever you are, but tonight it's sunny as we have Paul Walsh, the commentator and GT Sport Sim Racer. Welcome to the show, Paul. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing really well, thank you, Hugh. I'm very happy to be here as well, despite all the uh, the heavy winds, the sleet, the snow, and pretty much everything we've had in this February so far in the UK. How about yourself? Yeah, very good. Thanks. I've survived the winds and all the kind of things that's been going on and uh, even managed to get a day off from bus driving to be able to fit in an interview uh, like we have here tonight. Um, so that's yeah, fantastic to have you on the show. Um, and the question starts, as I do with all of my guests, how did your sim racing on gaming career, how did it all begin? Oh, goodness me. That's, uh, well, we'll split it into two halves. So sim racing, uh, started off back in what was uh, 2019. Uh, long story short, I'd been lurking mm -hmm. on a YouTuber's channel called uh, Key25 or Kieran uh, Boldrop oh, yeah. uh -huh. uh, for quite some time, watching his GT Sport content. And then I started sort of watching the FIA uh, World Tour events back then. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to go and invest my, in a PS4 and I'm going to start playing Grand Turismo Sport myself. Um, and unfortunately then, perhaps one of the, the darkest eras in my life came up pretty much in parallel, which was and if anybody has ever gone to my channel, they'll see it as my channel trailer, probably one of the longest videos I've done sim racing wise, uh, was that my dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Now, I shouldn't be smiling when I say this, but I say it with a, a tear in my eye and a bit of pride on my chest. Um, with my dad passing away gradually from me, he motivated me to take up sim racing because we always used to play Grand Turismo a lot on uh, PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2. And then I started to get involved in the, the FIA Manufacturer Series. So I raced in, for Honda in 2019. And in my inaugural series, when I started off as a D-rated driver, I made my way all the way out to A through the was the 20 race season and ended up finishing P10 for Honda, which was a star player ranking back yeah. then. And uh, well, midway through the season, my uh, my dad unfortunately passed away, left us. But um, it really it it galvanised me in the end to keep on going with sim racing. And from that point onwards, uh, decided to do the 2020 manufacturer series with Jaguar. When I actually switched from what was controller to my uh, Thrustmaster TGT, uh, didn't quite hit the star player spots in 2020 for Jaguar Fish P12 in the end. But a lot of people said I could have perhaps been top 10 if I had decided to move away from cockpit view because I was a cockpit racer at that point. And um, yeah, so sim racing from there, uh, well, that's sort of how I got into sim racing. I'll park that. Commentating, on the other hand, a very less tragic story, more of a bit of a, a series of comedies that made it happen. Uh, so commentating wise... Uh, Long story short, uh, I was watching once. Uh, sorry, one of my friends was taking part in just a casual GT Sport League, not anything, of, not anything major or official up for any prizes, but it was a weekly league. And myself mm -hmm. and a couple of other friends were watching them. We were watching the live broadcast. There was a commentator doing it. And well, I won't name names or name the series, but we, we were all watching them for our friend. And the commentator was, let's just say, they were about as engaging as seeing paint dry on a brick wall if I had to be <laughs> honest with you. And uh, well, we, we kept watching week on week, so it was an extended series. But in the end, we were sort of giving up watching because the commentator was taking away all the entertainment. So I said one day, and I sort of said it as a joke, I could probably do better than what the commentator's doing. And they, my friends said to me, you know what, next week, do the commentary. We'll mute the actual official commentary because we'll watch it on Twitch together. And so I commentated over the full evening. And well, they were absolutely speechless come the end of it. Although I had a really sore throat as well, to be fair, after <laughs> commentating over an hour's worth of yeah. racing. And they said, you should really take this up because you can do it really well. Fantastic. And uh, well, from that, uh, in parallel at the same time, and this was, I've got to say, it must have been, what was it? It was probably in about the summer of 2020, I joined a community known as Driver's Room, a very active Discord community. And hello to the guys at Driver's Room if they're tuning in right now. Shout out to all you wonderful people. Um, it was the case that they were running a number of series and... 
I got in touch with the organizer of a series, a uh, uh, chap named Gadget334. I won't use his full name on uh, on live stream, but um, Gadget334, he was running the Ace of Design Endurance Championship hosted by Drivers Room. And I said to him, look, I'd be very happy to live commentate. I'll volunteer my time. I'll do it completely for free and everything because uh, I just want to have a shot at trying to commentate. And he let me do that. So I commentated a couple of rounds. And then quite a famous face was part of that community, although he's not as much operating in the Grand Turismo sports sphere anymore. A chap named uh, Vanquish Dawson, or we like to know him in the real world as uh, Andrew Dawson, who is a professional carter. Uh, it is the case that he put me in touch with, now I can't remember for life me who was the organiser, but long story short, I think it was Club 100 were doing a team versus team championship on Grand Turismo Sport. Uh, so Dawson put me in touch with the organisers there, said that I was a really good commentator and that they could do with me as part of the commentary team for the team versus team championship. So I was one of the multiple commentators and I commentated all the way through the pools into the final and uh, finished the final. And then this is really where the snowball effect started to occur, because very shortly after, I had somebody reach out to me, a chap named Mark Sykes, um, who is one of the chief organizers at Next Gen Rating. And of course, a little bit of paid advertisement here. No, I do it for free. Um, uh, Mark Sykes reached out to me and said, look, really enjoyed the commentary on the Club 100. We'd love to have you as a commentator uh, for our series. So he then... Uh, asked me to commentate what was there at the time, their BMW M4 series on Grand Turismo Sports. This was coming towards the end of 2020, if I remember all the sequence events correctly, feels so long ago. And um, did that. It went down really well. Uh, had a couple of the guys there sort of give feedback to Mark and the team to say they really enjoyed the commentary. And then and then I started to get involved in PC sim commentating. Now, yeah. I should be honest, this is where things where the momentum got so great that I um, well, I sort of stumbled my way to success at this point because uh, going into, I think it was going into, was it going into 2021? It might have been at the tower. No, it was at the tower end of 2020. Um, I got put in touch with a chap named Kevin Smith, another one of the organizing team at Next Gen Race. And he was sort of right, we're, ho we're going to be hosting a, a league uh, in collaboration with the Sim Grid and Coach Dave Academy. Uh, okay. But before we do that, we want to spur up some interest. So we want to hold a couple of sort of race events, just one-off events. And we'd like you uh, to commentate on them. And it, this was sort of my job interview as well, in a way, to see if I could do it on PC. So you can imagine, I've been doing all my commentating on what was PlayStation 4. I've been doing it sat in my Sim Rig chair in a completely different room at the time, <laughs> hunched over like this with a keyboard, trying to commentate yeah. at the same time. <laughs> and now I'm able to sit in a sort of desk chair and do the commentary but the thing is i wouldn't know if my pc could handle a set of course of competition i didn't know how to set things up from a perspective of obs and i had a week uh, so i had to quickly go and buy a set of course of competition i had to get all the dlc i had to get it all set up and then on the day that I was meant to be doing the event i tried joining the server as a sort of test to make sure i could join and spectate it and it yeah. says i needed a safety rating oh and no. i thought to myself ah now, how do I get a safety rating? Quick Google. Ah, oh, you've got to do a load of driving on a set of course of competition. I've got two hours before I've got to commentate. Okay, well, I can't hook the rig up to, well, I can't hook the sim rig up to the PC because they're in two entirely different rooms. And they're now in one room, but that then they're in two separate rooms. Uh, so I was sort of, okay, what do I do? So I quickly scoured through the house, found a really old manky Xbox controller where it's got bits of dirt all over it where I've grabbed it over the years and it's gathered all dust. I'm sort of quickly racing through all the, uh, the, the sort of practice and whatnot to try to get a oh, sportsmanship no. rating. And there were 10 minutes to go before I meant to be commentating. It says you've got a sportsmanship unlock. If you've unlocked your sportsmanship, it's up to six. And I looked at the server, sportsmanship required one. I was sort of, right, let's go, let's commentate. Yeah, you've got it now. <laughs> and uh, from that That's point crazy. onwards, um, the test event went uh, fantastically. There were a couple of uh, moments where uh, things went a bit wrong. I butchered quite a few people's names, or what we like to refer to now as Walshisms, like Murrayisms, back when yeah. uh, the legendary Murray <laughs> Walker used to commentate. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. And uh, major inspiration to myself, to be honest, but a bit more on that later. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, did the test, uh, did the first test event that went down very well, and then they hosted another test event which uh, went even better. And then, while well, I've been commentating there, uh, Next Gen's a set of course of competition series on PC. Um, pretty much since what would be well, late 2020, going through all of 2021 and now into 2022, and right now I'm commentating their uh, world tour, and um. And then the sort of final part of the the trio in terms of commentating on iRacing, that came about through Next Gen again, through the the simple reason they said, well, you commentate ACC, can you commentate iRacing? And, well, I thought, 
you know what? Why not? Let's just give it a shot. And um, with iRacing, things went relatively okay at first. Uh, the first yeah. season I commentated on went absolutely fine. The second season, however, because the grid was 60 cars and my PC, well, all the parts in my PC that I was using then, and I've moved on to a new PC, were all five plus years old. Uh, yeah. My PC started to show signs of perhaps it's time to replace everything, but we, we had to do some magical wizardry with regards to uh, commentating uh, yeah. to get it to work. And the long story short, the wizardry was that I was covering two race groups that ran races on the exact same night on the exact same time and i had to cover one the next day as a replay and the other the uh, the other lives we just switched them around and that seemed to save yeah. uh, any issues but uh that that's really how i got to how i got to commentate it was through literally just some me saying to somebody yeah i can pretty do a better job and then somebody saying well if you think you can prove you can and then from that yeah. point onwards yeah. it's just uh it's just rolled on yeah but well, i can tell in your voice you've got a real enthusiasm and I think that's that's one of the key things, isn't it? It comes over that to describe a race and an event like that, and uh, people want someone who they know that they are definitely engaged um, with the racing. Uh, I mean, we have uh, Andrew and I, and uh, you'll see him as Ruse Racing Rambles there in the chat. And um, when we commentate on Tia and stuff, quite often <laughs> it's very easy to go way if, if it's a quiet point in the race because it's an hour long race. And um, sometimes we'll we all get distracted and end up talking about goodness knows what. Uh, but then we'll bring it back. We'll somehow manage to bring it back when there's overtakes and other kind of things that come into it. Um, but you were telling us in the, in the, in the kind of pre-show build-up um, that you've got some good stories as to the highlights and, and maybe the things that probably cause almost disaster um, yeah. in the races. Um, it'd be good to hear some of those stories. So the so I'll start off with the longest race I've ever commentated on. It's quite recent, in fact. And um... Well, I, I'm looking forward to doing more work with uh, a group called ERS or the European Racing Series on ACC. Uh, as time goes on, we're working on uh, arranging something at the moment for later this year. Uh, but long story short, they've recently kicked off what is their World Endurance Series. And the, the races are from six to 12 hours long. Mm. And well, I had signed up to commentate the season opener, the six hours of Imola. And I'd been told when in advance, there's going to be a co-commentator. So you'll be sharing commentary responsibilities because the longest race I'd ever commentated on up to that point were three hours long uh, in a single yeah. stint by myself. So six hours is double that That's length. Well, yeah, three hours is painful yeah. enough in yeah, terms yeah. on the vocal cords. Yeah. Well, it turns out literally on the day that I'm going to be commentating the six hours, I suddenly get told, uh, by the way, you're going to be commentating by yourself for six hours. And I was just sort of ah. sat there thinking, okay, right, we're going to do this. And uh, so the way it worked out, it was, it worked out really well in the end. I had to, um, I had to make a load of different adjustments. I'd already prepared a sort of load of things to talk about on yeah. a separate monitor sort of in the quiet moments, but that wasn't enough to fill out the six hours. And I thought my voice is going to be completely wrecked after three hours. Yeah, so I had to yeah. take the microphone, which you see here, and put it really nice and close to my mouth. And I was actually speaking yeah. like this all the way through, but because the microphone right. was very close, it was the case that it sounded as I was actually talking like I am I now. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, Managed to make it through, and the only break I had was literally a quick two-minute toilet break. Otherwise, it was five hours and 58 minutes of me sat there, and in the end, Goodness. I was just sort of absolutely trained. It was absolutely fantastic, and that was one of the, the biggest challenges. And, yeah. and afterwards, I had messages from the organizers of people saying, how on earth can you still be talking after six hours? Well, right, seven hours, you... really, because of the pre-roll <laughs> and the post-show. <laughs> yeah, no, that is something. Do you have some water or anything you can kind of drink to try and keep your, your kind of throat hydrated and things oh definitely i had a, uh, I had a whole flask of water by the side of me even that went dry so midway through the toilet break i had to quickly run downstairs turn the sink on and well unfortunately uh there it was the case that the water was hot because um we're oh, well, living no. with my mum at the moment it was a situation she just washed the dishes and i'd had no time to make the water go cold so i was drinking warm water oh, which no. was nice. no. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that that sounds like where everything could go wrong. It did go wrong, uh, <laughs> but you managed to kind of keep it going through the whole thing. But uh, no, because I mean that's that's one of the hardest things because I know from some of the guys be watching and we'll watch this um, later on as well. You know, because there's so many leagues that have been set up and people are trying to get into commentary and and trying to be able to do it properly. Um, it's uh, what would you say is the main skill you need to have to be a good commentator? So. 
I would say the main skill you need to have is being spontaneous in what you say. So yeah. the way I would think about it is um, when you when you watch something back on TV, because this is how I practice technique and funny enough, this is how when I started to take it more seriously as a hobby, um, when I, I drive, because I drive actively every, uh, every couple of days, and I used to do a lot more driving before COVID-19 came and locked us all down. Um, what I used to do is sort of talk about events that are happening around me. So if I felt that somebody in front of me was going to be uh, breaking too late into a roundabout or something, or that I could commentate on it, and it's being able to observe what's happening and then being able to tell yeah. the story or craft the story out of it. That, I think, is the, the art as the commentator. But at the same time, if nothing's happening, you have to, whilst it, you have to sell it to an extent, it's yeah. also one of those situations whereby... I wouldn't try to try and oversell the fact that nothing's happening. If nothing's happening, just find something yeah. to talk about or talk about, say, strategy that's playing out in the race or alternatively little things you may have noticed or things for people to watch out for in 10 minutes' time when you think stuff could yeah. occur. And I think that's the biggest change is being able to improvise on the spot because it doesn't matter how many notes you make before a race. Uh, sim racing, much like real-world racing, it's not scripted. Uh, although some people would say that certain races are rigged in the real world. I mean, we have to look at Formula One in 2021. Yeah, a lot yeah, of people yeah. would say that it was rigged in some regards. Yeah, yeah, uh, Tim, yeah. Tim Fall hat conspiracies on. But <laughs> you just have to, th that's the thing. Anything can happen over the course, and particularly in endurance races. You could have someone who's leading the race by over the best part of a minute compared to the rest of the field just to have them yeah. bin it in the final 30 seconds of the race. And you can't tell that's going to happen. So you've got to be ready for it. Uh, yeah, I always remember, um, I think it was the French Grand Prix, way back in 1993, I think it was, um, or there about 92, 93, um, and it was a very quiet race, not much was happening, um, and so James Hunt decided to, to come on and, and say, it must have been 92, I think, um, and he had spoken to Ayrton Senna in the, mm -hmm. before the race, um, and Senna had said, I want you to bring, the, to announce this, that I will drive um, for Williams for free at some point yes. during the race. And of course, in a quiet point, uh, I remember Murray Walker says, then James Bunt, J James Hunt dropped a, a bombshell. Uh, and, is, and he said, of course, Ayrton Senna um, has, has said to me today that he will drive for Williams, for Frank Williams for free, just so mm -hmm. he can drive alongside Alain Prost. And of course, immediately the whole, everything just blew up, you know, I mean, in, in today's age, you can imagine the Twitter and all oh, the, yeah. the whole thing would just go go mental, you know, um, and that kind of thing. But as you say, you've got to come up with a story um, mm -hmm. or something that's going to about to happen um, to make to make the, the race look, look good. So do you um, have any kind of inspirations from uh, the past as to how you kind of model your commentating um, kind of strategy and things? So... As I said earlier, my my biggest inspiration would be Murray Walker because, and yeah. when I grew up, so uh, I was born in '93. So when I was very young, I used to watch the Formula One sat on my dad's lap, and this was when I was sort of two, three years old. And back then, when Murray Walker was really. Uh, whilst he was in the sort of equinox of his career, if you will, uh, it was at the same time being able to hear things such as, uh, or, and also watching video footage back when I got a bit older, such as when Damon yeah. Hill won the Formula One Championship at oh, Suzuka yeah, yeah. and the infamous yeah. line from Murray Walker, and now there's a tear in my eye. Yeah, yeah. That level of emotion and the fact that the, th the thing that I always want to try and echo, which Murray Walker did incredibly well. And I think the the chap who recently left F4, uh, sorry, Formula One commentary on Channel 4, I can't remember his name for the life of me, um, but he only recently uh, he got replaced by Alex Jacks and David Coulthard. But what was it, Ben Edwards? Wasn't Ben Edwards? That's the one. Yeah, yeah Ben it, Edwards, yeah. I think. Yeah. I think with them, they can they teleport you away from the world you're sat in. So right now, as I'm talking to you, um, I, I can forget about the world around me. So I can forget about the, the four walls I'm enclosed in and I become engrossed in what I'm talking about and whatnot. And it's the same with their commentary. You forget that you're watching it on the TV. It's almost as if you are, well, you are witnessing history. It's yeah, just that yeah. you are there right at the heart of witnessing that history rather than just sort of sat there and going, oh, he's going around the corner again. And that's <laughs> what I want to try and echo in the work that I do is I've at, what I want to try and achieve is at the end of the day, when people watch a show for whether it's an hour, two hours, I want them for that hour to forget about any troubles they've got in their life. And just yeah. if it can bring a smile and some happiness to their day, then I know yeah. I've done something right. Even if it's just one person, it makes yeah. it worth it every time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'd say and it's, it's, it's an amazing thing, isn't it? Because you remember certain phrases from a race um, that make it work. And I remember Ruth saying there, um, the one on 99, uh, when Damon won the championship, he says, I have to stop talking 
because I have a lump in my throat. Yes. I was there and it was it was wonderful. And it was an it was an incredible, that was an amazing race. Um and uh, but there were so many. I remember uh, uh Monaco 1992, mm -hmm. uh, Senna and Mansell, and that last those last few laps where I remember Murray Walker saying, and Mansell is catching by five seconds a lap. You know, because he had to come in for his pit stop and get new tires, so he thought he had a puncture um, and all of that. And in that, that last lap was incredible, um, as they, as they, you know, it was so close and and they weaving along and all all the kind of phrases that Murray came out with, um, as if because there's one bit where he's coming into the I think the Rascas and then mm -hmm. and and Mansell, and uh, 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 Murray says and he's trying this way and that way, but Senna won't let him pass. Uh, as if Senna is going to let him pass. <laughs> is the you know is the is the great thing. Um, but uh, but no, it was such. It, it's the emotion that goes into it, and it does it does get you carried away, um, and you, it makes you just think, oh, this is this is the best sport um, you can see, and 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 how it all kind of works, isn't it? That um, and you know the, the thing is, in some of the the ACC races and 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 even FIA uh, GT Sport races, there've been some fantastic battles um, and some really good overtakes. Um, it's uh, how how do you what, what kind of um, uh, overtaking do you like to see or how do you kind of describe a really good overtake so for me the, the best overtakes come of right well not necessarily right at the end of the race but when you know it's going to define the outcome of the race so i'll give yeah. you a, a really good example and it can be sometimes just through strategy when the overtake occurs um so in the acc world tour when i commentated round two earlier this week spoiler alert for anybody who uh doesn't want to hear the outcome of the race before i reveal it um so three two one spoiler alert complete it is the case that um sebastian apostle who took the the checker flag in the end he had played his strategy out so well versus the drivers he was battling for the win and in the end he decided he had to undercut his rival in order to win the race and you could see it was coming you could see when he pulled into the pits that was the sign yeah. and we're changing conditions as well because the circuit went almost dry and then the rain came back just after his pit stop and it what it meant was that you were on this edge as though would a postal be able to do it by undercutting or would it be the case that the drivers he was battling with would come out ahead of him and he came out and he just came out i think it was four seconds ahead of the rest of the field and it was yeah. it was the perfect strat strategic overtake so i love that uh, but in terms of on battles uh, sorry overtakes on circuit i do love watching an overtake round the outside Side, and there's plenty yeah. I've seen, and particularly in I racing at I think it's the Circuit Road Atlanta Turn One. I can't remember the name of the driver. I think it was Stuart Stuart P Taylor. I want to say from uh, TGC Racing around there, or it might, I might be thinking of somebody else. But I know a driver there. I think he did a double overtake around the outside, so two drivers yeah. around the outside yeah. of Turn One at Road Atlanta, which you just don't do. But he managed yeah. to pull it off, and it's those <laughs> kind of overtakes which defy your expectations. Of yeah. course, it relies on the drivers who are defending to give the space and show the respect. But you know, at yeah. the end of the day, they're driving on the limit. And even if it is sim racing, it, yeah. it, you've got to believe it. It's just as much like real world racing because these guys are taking it that serious. And in real world, in touring car, I've seen it. In Formula One, I've seen it. It's the case those overtakes where a driver puts everything on the line those are the best ones yeah yeah it's the thing i remember the first race i did on and fair's community on the on the pc so it was my first ever build up and, and trying to uh to, to race and we we're in the porsche uh, 911 super cup mm -hmm. uh, cup cars it was um and uh, and i thought well normally the start's probably my best chance of of uh you know trying to get ahead and trying to make up some places i was mid-pack uh, mid to probably late pack to be fair i was like there's about 30 of us involved and i was around about 20 or so thereabouts um uh, between 15th and 20th and uh, and i wondered why i hadn't listened to the 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 engineer you know that said stay off the curbs you know lower yeah. low tire pressures and, I thought, I don't know, I don't <laughs> and then, then as you do when you first start um and of course i came up at brands hatch and it's on the first corner um and i wonder why everybody was going so slowly and i thought god they're really crawling Round the the first one, I kind of went straight through and made it, and it looked looked fantastic. Going around the first corner, and of course, then I hit the curb going down, <laughs> and I and I just came off the gas slightly, and then I had a huge spin, and that was me. So I was the comedy sidekick in that race because I had you know I was the entertainment as the, as my car um, pirouetted off uh, off into the wall and ended up last. But I, I got going again, um, but it was quite fun. So so I realised that yes, you actually have to slow down or be careful for the curbs. Uh, when your tire pressures are low, um, oh, but uh, but it is such good fun though. That, that's the thing, and and you you can have some great laughs, um, and also avoiding people because if other people are spinning off all over the place on the first lap or the first few corners, um, it's a great thing when when you when you manage to get through and not hit anybody yeah. and manage to make up some places. What's been some of the best kind of 
um, kind of starts that you've seen? And how do you find commentating on the start of a race? So the best starts I've typically seen, it, it depends. If it's a standing start, I always love to see drivers who get a really good launch off the line and gain multiple places in uh, in one run up towards turn number one. And, well, yeah. some of the best ones I've seen have been uh, in what would be in Gran Turismo Sport. And actually... No, in fact, it would be uh, in iRacing in the uh, middle of the pack racing league, which I'm commentating on the moment, on their uh, touring car racing championship series, uh, where I've seen some drivers who, with uh, the, the start, gain a load of places in the run down to the opening corner. Um, other ones I've seen sort of where rolling starts are concerned. It's normally where you see a driver who's running less downforce, particularly in a set of course of competition, where if they've yeah. got less downforce and it's a long run to turn one, such as running down towards Imola's opening corners at the Tamburello yeah. chicane. See, yeah somebody who's got a lot of speed and able to sort of thread their way through all the cars like threading the needle and they yeah. just manage to gain two three places and they come all the way up or if there's a sort of incident ahead of them but they're the one who continues to gain that ground and they gain say six seven eight places in a single stroke those are the those are the best yeah. ones i've seen um uh. I can't really think of any names off the top of my head, unfortunately, but I've seen a number of them in my time. And it's, it, no, it's just, it's brilliant. But again, it's one of those things where you know that driver for, at that moment, the adrenaline must have been pumping hard. Yeah, yeah. It's like watching Alonso on a start, yeah. on it, whenever he does a, a race start, isn't it? Because he has a, an ability to get through the field and come from 12th or 13th. And by the end of the, the first lap, he's in seventh mm -hmm. or something like that, isn't it? And, and you just watch as he picks. Through and, and I think that's the thing you get to find for people is um are they do they start and they go on the outside or do they try and overtake on the inside? Isn't yeah. it? That's the kind of thing. And they have a particular style. But um, but we've got a question for you from Rice Racing. Uh, is um uh, what would be your ideal race to commentate on? Uh, i.e. any particular series or event that would stand out. So uh, to answer Rice Racing's question, uh, if it was so in sim racing. I I would love to come. Well, I'm loving commentating on touring cars at the moment in iRacing in the middle of the pack racing league series. I absolutely adore it. Adore a touring car. Um, not to say any other disciplines not great, but at the same time, absolutely loving it. So in sim racing, it would be touring cars. Uh, in real world, I would also love to commentate on touring cars. Alternatively, something on the lines of say the the Genetta Cup that would be absolutely fantastic. It's great to see yeah. now that the Genetta G56 uh, in the near future. They're going from the G55 platform and the Genetta yeah. racing is always very intense. I had the pleasure of seeing it at Brands Hatch uh, at the end of last year when they were wrapping up the touring car season and uh, no, it was brilliant. So those would be my two. It'd be Genettas in the real world and well, touring cars in the sim world. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's quite a thing. And Rue is just uh, mentioning as well, Alonso and Weber through Eau Rouge and up Radulion. Oh, to a race that was that was amazing but they also had a fantastic race at silverstone i think around about the same era as well um where i remember that was incredibly close and they were coming up the old start finish straight and they were neck and neck going around there and coming through was it it's not beckett's it's that first right hander that now they go pretty much flat out um and it's amazing how they do it but um but yeah and, and uh, did you like um, some of the kind of single seater racing you know like formula renault and other stuff i know they do that on i racing um, but do you find that, that those kind of races can bring out some quite good uh, overtaking and, and quite quite good events? It's it's an odd one for me. So so open uh, so open wheel single seaters. I like watching them. So I love watching Formula One, although I'm taking a hiatus from Formula One this year after the, the season finale because yeah. that was a bit too much for me. But I do really do enjoy watching single seater. However, would if I was ever offered to drive one, uh, yeah. I, I'm not interested in actually driving a single seater. It just doesn't appeal to me. I like That's closed funny. wheel machines in terms yeah. of driving them. Yeah. But again, that might be because of the cars I drive, but it's one of those situations whereby I think it's um, they're great on TV, but they're not for me. But I well, to commentate yeah. on them, to be fair, I'd never say no. I know there's uh, a number of F3 series going around on iRacing at the moment, and they've also got yeah. Formula V, so never say never there. Well, Formula V is hilarious. Oh, it it's, is. Uh, I, I remember my first race on that. I ended up doing a, uh, what did it, it was um, a kind of, uh, <laughs> I kind of flew sideways uh, into the trees <laughs> um, because uh, somebody hit me on the tyre and then we, we launched off. Um, so I got disqualified uh, after that one of my first attempts. Uh, but it was, it is, I think Formula V is probably my favourite iRacing uh, race. That, I've done a little bit on Skip Barbers and then the, the Mazda MX-5s are quite good. Um, the MX-5s but, are fantastic. Yeah, yeah, you can get some good battles. But I do find that iRacing, uh, maybe not so much with the Mazdas, but on a lot of the cars, it's almost like the brakes, like an on-off switch. It's quite mm -hmm. hard to get, you know, it tends to just lock up straight away. 
Well, another racing game is you get a little bit more progressive braking because I know, like on a real racing car, you've got to hit the brakes really hard and the you know to get the car to slow down initially, you know, to get the speed off, and it, it shouldn't be locking up when it does that. But that's my my kind of one annoyance of iRacing is that it just seems to lock up the wheels so easily. Um, oh, but, indeed. Yeah, so because obviously you've got to, I know you get the things you can do with a setup with brake balance and and things like that. Um, but uh, how how do you find that that, that things like iRacing and ACC compare? So if I had because I I do a lot of sim racing now on PC. I mean, I started off on Gran Turismo Sport, and uh, if I start there. The one thing I found I found with Gran Turismo Sport in particular, I suspect Gran Turismo 7 will continue this trend, albeit obviously it will up the ante as they always want to Polyphony. Mm. I found it was it's a great way to get into sim racing without losing too much of the attachments that arcadey feel. And what I mean by that is yeah. that you don't get oh you don't have to be studying your craft too much in Gran Turismo Sport to really get a feel for the car and being able to attack certain circuits. And yeah. for me. Um, with my background uh, in being a business analyst, I, I must admit I am an absolute sucker for detail. When you you put me into something, regards that, I'll read every little bit, study every nook and cranny. So yeah. when I've then gone to a set of course of competition, firstly, what I found with a set of course of competition is that the I've had to forget everything I learned in Gran Turismo Sport, particularly the whole turn off traction control, turn off the ABS. No, those yeah. are the system for the gentleman racers to enable them to be able to control these beastly heavy machines. And yeah. I found with a set of course of competition, you really have to. And I'll quote James Baldwin when he put up a video on his YouTube channel. Uh, obviously, James Baldwin being a real-world racer now, as well yeah. as the world's fastest sim racer. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, you're almost like trying to force a bathtub for a quarter at times. It, the weight of the car, and then trying to transition it from full throttle to brakes to turn into apex, then power on exit and accelerate away. You're, you've got a master. It's almost as if you're riding a horse and you've got to rein that horse in and say, no, you are turning left at this corner. We are going down to second gear. We are going to exit yeah. on time. And I absolutely love that feel. And meanwhile, with iRacing, it's, it's been odd. I haven't spent as much time in iRacing as I have a set of course of competition. But I feel yeah. that iRacing, the cars are a little bit lighter in terms of they feel yeah. they feel much more sensitive. And this is, I'm using my experience of GT3 versus GT3 yeah. across the three platforms here. Um, I really think it's the case that they feel a bit lighter in iRacing. And as you, self, as you say yourself, you with regards to uh, going heavy on the brakes, it feels as though the brakes lock up immediately. And I'm fine with that, but I feel as though that's quite a hard thing to get used to. And the one thing I've done to practice that feel is I've actually spent quite a bit of time driving the Corvette C8 GTE, where those cars aren't allowed to run anti-lock braking systems. It is the case. You have no defense. If you go too heavy on the brake, it's a lock up yeah. and you go straight across the road. And yeah, uh, well, yeah. there's, there's some comical moments of that, particularly taking part in some <laughs> open lobbies with some uh, relatively big names in the world of yeah. racing. But uh, no, that's that's, that's been good fun. It's actually disciplined my my left foot braking massively, and it's helped me out when I've gone back to a set of course of competition and being able to um, more fine tune my inputs between braking and throttle. So I'd say a set of course of competition has been the one that I've enjoyed the most because I feel as though I'm learning the most out of it. But I racing, I'm also enjoying, and I think i racing if you want something that's really sensitive that's what you go for but if you're looking for something that's a bit more forgiving quote unquote but forgiving is a bit subjective a set of course competition is great but if you're looking for something yeah. that's a bit more arcadey and entry then Gran Turismo Sport does very well yeah that's the thing isn't it because on ACC I try and go with the lowest traction control I can get away with because I find that it's so much better coming out of a corner if you can you know you're doing the throttle yourself and because if you, it's very easy if you put it right up that before you know it, and it's, it's standard settings are very high um, and it just doesn't accelerate out of a bend, isn't it? Because it's, <laughs> it's, it's just not doing anything. So you need to kind of lower it down to get yourself a bit quicker. I think that's probably been one of the main reasons why I've improved in my times um, because I'm not waiting for the car to accelerate by it when it chooses to. It's doing it when I tell it to. Um, and that's because you can lose so much time when you're sitting there wondering, especially in the wet, if you go out on a wet setup. Um, and it just won't drive the wheels at all um, because it's obviously allowing for a slip. Um, but uh, but no, it's 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 great fun. But I, I do like it. I think as you say, by I racing, you've you've got to put the time in and get used to how the car handles. It's not so much a a, a, a game where you can just turn up and drive, is it? Yeah. I think you have to, and that's the problem. You have so many games, and you you want to have a go on each one and see what it's like. Um, but I think I racing doesn't really work like that. You've got to kind of hone the skill of how how the cars work. But, Most um, definitely. Yeah, yeah. But, um, so what's been your biggest surprise in, in doing commentary? What's been like one of the nicest things that's happened or or your kind of biggest surprise during a race or an event? 
So uh, start off with biggest surprise. Uh, the biggest surprise I've ever had uh, is that I've had the opportunity to commentate over real world racers who I absolutely love watching on TV racing in the series that I commentate on. Uh, so, for example, uh, more Adam Morgan from BTCC. He race uh, he races in the Mazda MX-5 Cup that I commentate uh, for Next Gen Racing alongside Crest Auto Sports, uh, Alex Everett. And well, being able to talk about Adam Morgan, I actually say the name and know that he's there. Yeah. Okay, it's virtual, but that's uh, actually brilliant. And also in an actual uh, Chichley Motorsport every dev x5 just like yeah. as if he was in the honda um the that that plus also for example uh, being able to commentate over uh, antonio giovanazzi who raced uh, he oh. did a brief cameo in the um next gen i racing gt3 season two at le mans oh. which was absolutely brilliant to see and for to have that opportunity so those have been the biggest surprises um the biggest or the, be the best things that happen the things that i really love it's it's not really one thing it's all the people that i get to sort of engage with as part of commentating so whether it's the drivers or certainly the organizers or even the fans who then send me feedback after saying did a fantastic job really enjoyed the broadcast and even the drivers when they come back and say that it's i can understand um when obviously when we lost when we lost Ayrton Senna from Formula One, one of the things yeah. that when I watched about the Senna documentary and also watched a number of the other sort of separate documentaries about is the whole motorsport, it's not just about the 20 or so drivers, but it's about the commentators. It's about all the staff, the mechanics. It's it's a huge family. And I've heard that term used more and more over the last decade when referring to motorsport, that it's the, mm. the sort of the F1 paddock, the collective that goes yeah. to an event, yeah. or it's the, the Formula One family that goes to an event. It's the same, obviously. And it really feels as though... I'm part of such a huge family and I'm very privileged to be part of that. And I say interacting with so many people and yeah. whether it be some of the younger drivers who I've commentated on, who they got their mums and dads tuning in watching and hearing their yeah. feedback and saying, mum and dad loved watching it. They thought it was a real world race or some <laughs> of the older drivers saying that they really enjoyed it. I mean, for it, I've met the guys that are uh, made for racing, the team I do uh, racing for, plus also SAS Racing, I'm going to name drop two there, who I do racing yeah. with. And while I've met all the guys that made for racing in person, I never thought I'd meet them, but we all uh, met up in yeah. person at the Brands Hatch. And it, it's, it's, all, it's been part of such a big family, and that's what I love about it. It's the fact that it really feels special every time I get into the commentary chair, because I'm not doing it for myself. I, I get paid yeah. to do some commentary, I do some voluntary. I couldn't care about the money. It's yeah, just being yeah. able to be happy. And that's something we all need in our lives. It's something that makes us happy. And commentary for me is the happiest place I could be. Yeah, it is It is amazing. I have to admit, it's like, even though you can go ups and downs with like your F1, um, if you like F1 or not, or a particular uh, championship, um, it does make, it, it kind of, it, it makes the hairs on your back stick up sometimes, especially when you're at a real race, isn't it? And you and, and that you hear the engines finally start, oh, yeah. and and oh, and out they come out of the pits and they finally come past. And the bit that you were saying earlier with your GT3 cars, and you heard the Audi. And I went to the Blancpain uh, race mm -hmm. with David Perel um, uh, about three years ago. Uh, I got to meet him and and because uh, I've interviewed him a couple of times. But he said, "Oh, if you're about to come to the come to the pits and uh, and uh, so I've got a photograph. He's up there behind me there and one of the ones that um I'm, so it, I'm incredibly was, jealous <laughs> he's a lovely lovely chap really really decent guy and uh, I, i'd gone we'd, we'd, we'd managed to get a ticket which allowed me to go onto the pit walk as well so mm -hmm. i'd go into the grid and the whole thing um uh, but i'd missed the signing of the signatures but he was still there and things had quietened down so i was able to go along and he recognized me straight away and bear in mind i think i'd only interviewed him uh, once at that point and he recognized me straight away and he said oh yeah come and get a photograph and we'll do this and he chatted away for about five minutes uh, which i thought was lovely and then of course he went on to watch the the, the race but uh it's an amazing the sound of it all but uh, what, one thing i'll never forget and i say it to all my to my guests it must be boring, boring them is uh, silly but the one uh, grand prix i actually saw live um was the european grand prix in 1993 and yeah. i saw senna win at donington um, and that was just oh, it's still it's still it always brings a tear to your eye, man. It's just uh, everything you remember of that race was just in, in, incredible. We were at the Donington Loop at the back, and we saw Schumacher go off into the sand um, and coming in as he as he braked too late, had a problem. Um, and of course, we saw the first lap where by the time Senna came past us, he was second, and then he went down the hill. We couldn't see him, and then he came back up, and then he was in the lead, and then that was that was that. Um, and eventually we saw Hill go past Prost and things like that. So it was, but it was the most incredible 
thing to witness. And I think that's what motorsport does. Uh, it, it just, it, it's such a, you'll never forget the races that you've been to because they all have an effect on you. And oh, indeed. You know, and it's it's a thing. I, I, I mean, how do you, what's your, your favourite kind of, um, a, a kind of motorsport uh, championship to actually watch uh for me so it is uh it is btcc absolutely love uh watching british touring car championship um but i think next year because i have been in the background and um, we had it recently the wrap-up of the uh fanatec world tour intercontinental gt championship i'm going to be spending a lot of time watching uh the gt world challenge in 2022 yeah. i do yeah. love watching that as one well. haven't had the opportunity to see it live like i've seen touring car live um so it is a crisscross between those two but touring car always has a special place in my heart for the yeah. for the simple reason it's I, I mean, we've got the legendary moments such as John Cleland going for first, yeah. the uh, the legendary yeah. middle finger as um, <laughs> Murray Walker turned it away. Uh, yeah. But it's I, I think one of the things that I love about uh, series like that and also GT World is that you have drivers out there who are the professionals, but you also have the pro-ams and you have the ams, or we, what we also used to refer to as the privateers or the guy who literally it's him and four mates in a shed. I mean, yeah. a little bit of trivia, uh, you'll... If you follow Touring Car, and anybody in the chat, as I just looked at the chat there, follows uh, Touring Car, you may know Team Hard Racing. Now, I never realised, but the guy who used to run, well, who still runs the se- uh, run the team, uh, a chap named Gillum, I think it's Tony Gillum, I'm not 100% sure the mm-hmm. first name, he, when I used to live in Swanley and Kent, he literally lived down the end of my street. And he was oh. running the team back then as a privateer mm-hmm. entry. And now Team Hard has grown into a fully fledged team. They have Nick Hamilton driving for them. And I do mm-hmm. believe that they've also got, I think it's, uh, well, I don't know if it's been confirmed yet, but I do think they may have Bobby Thompson joining uh, them. But I've heard rumors mm-hmm. about that. I don't know if that's true, but a number yeah, of other drivers yeah. as well. And that's that for me, that's what I love about series. Again, Formula One's fantastic. The premier sport in the world, the best 20 yeah. or so drivers. But I love to see pros and then amateurs racing together because it's yeah. sort of, it gives you that inspiration that one day not necessarily oh, i'm too old for it now but um you could see one day that say if i had a son for example or say my best friend as a kid that that could be the next generation they yeah. make their way yeah. up very gradually yeah 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 now that's the thing well i, I know you were born in 93 while well, i was watching touring cars at not kill in 94 <laughs> uh, and i saw uh, G- gabrielle tarquini go bar- barrel roll off um, yeah. at the at Dingley Dale or they call it on the first couple of corners at Knock Hill um, and it's Alfa Romeo 155 um, and I remember watching it afterwards on the on the on the review which with uh, again Murray Walker doing the commentary um, and, and it was quite a quite a crash I remember seeing the truck bring the car back um, <laughs> he got out and he walked away um, but uh, but no it was it was a spectacular and it, it is great fun I, I was up there about two three years ago uh, watching BTCC and, and it was great fun um, and it's, it's, it seems to be regaining its, uh, you know, its success again and getting quite good crowds and, and, uh, and you know, more people watching it. Because in the 90s, it was massive. Uh, when oh, you had all these different, you know, and I think it was a great year. You had the Toyota, Corolla, well, you had the Carina Saloons, you had the, um, you had the Alfa Romeos, you had, I'm not, I think, what else? What was the other one? You had, you had Nissan, um, you had Volvo Nissan Estates. Primary. Yeah, Volvo yep. 850 Estates. Um, oh, two things are saying I was at Knock Hill that day as well. Oh my goodness! It's uh, it was, uh, but it was never it was phenomenal because um, I think it was like it, it, you looked at cars and you thought I could go and buy one. It was Precisely. you know you could go and buy your Ford Mondeo, um, you know, and Andy Rouse was driving one of those. Um, it was it, it was kind of those things. And some great battle, John Cleland driving a Vauxhall Cavalier for goodness <laughs> sake, you know. Um, and then eventually it was a I don't know if it was a Vectra after that, but it was mainly a Cavalier in those days. Um, but um, so no, it was an amazing battle. And you think you know what it is? It's just a stripped out car. Um, mm-hmm. With a great engine, I remember I watched Mansell race a few times at Donington yep. when he had this big crash with Tiffany Dell. I am um, I was there on that day uh, down at Donington, and uh, where he was not happy with that, and he blamed Tiffany Dell. Um, for I don't know if he brake checked him or something, but they had a big argument about that. Um, but uh, but no, so it's, it is fantastic, and to be able to do that on a simulator and try and, and re re kind of um, create that is is even more impressive. I do love a set of Corsa. The, uh, or because the, the, you can get the Alfa Romeo one five five Q four touring cars on that, and that's often a race I would I, I do like to do. Um, but I'm hoping that maybe Gran Turismo might might uh, do a few of them and get some more Alfa Romeos um, on their on their list for the for GT seven. That would be quite good um, oh, to see would what be they very do. Good. It? I think if they could get a good touring car base 
on that. But see, there is a, there is a touring car game as well coming out um, uh, uh, quite soon, um, supposed to be uh, based on the series. So that that could be an interesting one because they used to have it back in the nineties. Um, talk of touring cars was a great yep. game. Yeah, yeah I remember those on the uh, the old PlayStation One, uh, Toka One, Toka Two, and whatnot. And uh, yeah, we we are we do need a new touring car game because we shouldn't forget about it. I mean, there's so many touring car series around the world. Yeah, yeah, but this was it was based on the British touring cars. Yeah, and I always remember Toka Two was excellent because it had some of the feeder series that was into that, and I, I had a great. It had some wonderful bugs and things that would happen in that. I did a <laughs> you, you could do a Formula Ford race, I think. I think it was a Formula Ford types uh, race you could do. And I remember racing at Silverstone um, and I touched somebody's wheel coming into the first corner and they cartwheeled off um, and crashed. And then the, the next lap, I kid you not, I came round the corner and the guy was there next to his car waving his fist at me uh, when I came <laughs> round. So it was, I it was a great, it was definitely a bug or something or they'd programmed it in if you had a big crash um, or if you caused something. But it was fantastic that the AI would do something like that. But uh, so what, what are your hopes for, for GT7 as well, as it's about to come out in a week or so? So for Grand Turismo 7, I think what I hope for, because obviously we've had a lot of information, and I think the, the biggest black cloud that most people, and even those watching right now who are looking towards Grand Turismo 7, I think the, the online aspects, what I hope for is in private lobbies in particular, we just get some more lobby options. And as I was saying to you in the pre-show, Hugh, the thing that I, I think at the moment that Polyphony really needs to do, they need to give us more options such as things such as setting the rolling start speed, setting the rolling start distance, uh, also being able to apply ballast to drivers' cars, things on those lines. If we can have those options, mm -hmm. then one thing that Gran Turismo Sport does incredibly well outside the FIA races at the moment is it has that pick up and play league racing aspect where you can have a Sunday league, you can organize it within five, 10 minutes, you and 15 other friends can go racing. And I think just yeah. a bit more customization there. And they could right. be on to, obviously they're, not, they're targeting moving it back towards single player as well as multiplayer. But yeah. if they give us more options in those private lobbies, it just, it will give us more to play with. And in turn, that's one of the things that the moment Grand Turismo Sport, we've almost exhausted every, well, at least I know in the communities I'm part of, whether it be mm -hmm. Driver's Room, the uh, GTSRL, so that's Grand Touring Series Racing League and other communities, we've pretty much exhausted every option that we've got to play around with, that we can't really find a new way to throw BMW M3s around a circuit until yeah, we find ways yeah. of sort of changing up the start procedure. And, that, and that's what we, we really need in Grand Turismo. So and that's my main hope is more lobby customization. Um, but outside of that, I'm really looking forward to seeing how Gran Turismo 7 handles the uh, what is the dynamic weather. I know it's only coming to certain circuits, but that'll be interesting. Yeah. Plus the uh, time of day transitions. I mean, I mean, some people could be listening right now and thinking, well, yeah, but a set of courses has already got that by comparison. Well, yeah, it may be the case, but I, I'll be interested to see how Polyphony Digital handle that because that's the one thing that is pulling me away from Gran Turismo is the the dynamicism of uh, iRacing yeah. or a set of course competition. The fact that I can start a race where the track temperature is 21 degrees centigrade and within half an hour it drops by two degrees and I've got to keep an eye on my tyre pressures. I That mm -hmm. for me is the kind of racing I personally enjoy um, yeah, yeah. because there's, there's more uncertainty and I have to be ready for the race distance and I don't have the the sort of expectation the car is always going to handle the same way every time it goes through turns one through to 13 at a particular circuit and that's what yeah. i want to see more of unpredictability if they can add that yeah. then one to a winner yeah that'll bring a real skill because i know that some of the guys on acc if they've got maybe an engineer with them or people who know the game well they can get a good setup to try and help them give them options isn't it but uh yeah that's going to be hard work if you're if you're trying to do that by yourself uh <laughs> to come up, you need to know your stuff or on the engineering side to be able to get your car to, um, to last the distance, isn't it? And be able to get the best kind of performance out of it. Um, well, that's, but... that's the thing. With the um, with uh, one of my best friends who I race with at the moment, and we race as part of a little team on a low fuel motorsport and a set of course of competition. He's more of a, a qualifying driver. He can do a 20 minute sprint faster than I ever will be able to, but I can manage yeah. a car compared to him over 60 minutes and still have the car to spare after. And we're training one another in the opposite sort of side of the spectrum yeah. to improve. Yeah. But I like that because it means that it's not always about being the guy who's the fastest over one lap. It is that unpredictability. Because if you can manage a car over 60 minutes, then the guy who's fast out the blocks but struggles after 20 minutes, he's going to be reined right back in 
And yeah. that's one of the things that Gran Turismo Sport struggles with at the moment is that you can yeah. manage tyres to an extent. And I mean, well, you've had him on the show, Mikhail, uh, Mikhail Zhao, probably the ultimate tyre managing guru of anybody in Gran Turismo Sport, just finds a way to magically make tyres last longer than anybody else and get the pace out of them. And we need, I think that's what we need. We need the we need to sort of bring to light the fact that it's not all about the one lap race. It is also yeah. about the 10 laps and how the cars last. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I think that was the key that I was trying to do in the shorter races that maybe last 15 to 20 minutes is you can have a really good start and then in turn you can, uh, but then you have make mistakes after a few laps and then that's what catches you out and you've got to try and get the consistency, right? So by the end of that, you know, 20 minutes, you're still up there. And and in that, because it's amazing the amount of mistakes I was racing on Monday um, and when you're about three quarters of the way through, um, and this was like it was like a half an hour race, um, you could see people making the mistakes. You know, they obviously get a bit tired, and and then they'd go off and they'd go on the grass and things like that. It was at Ulton Park, um, and it was I made up some probably four or five places in the last ten minutes of the of the race just because people had gone off, and you try and keep on. But uh, you've got a fan in the chat there. Um, we've got um, Pio Sco. He says Paul Walsh, the greatest commentator ever. And he says, thank you for commentating on GT Fusion. Oh, that's, that's a story. Oh, goodness me. Okay. If you want a funny story, uh, uh, hello to you, P.O. Scope, because, uh, well, actually, I should say it to the camera. Good, uh, good evening, my friend, and uh, it's good to hear from you. So GT Fusion for the Uninitiated is the, as I understand it, it is the biggest team versus team championship within the world of Gran Turismo. They've been running it all the way since Gran Turismo 5. Uh, and it's, it's in fact, it's uh, 10 years old as of uh, last year. They're going into the 11th year now, moving on to Gran Turismo 7. Now, uh, when I when I did that Club 100 event and uh, Mark Sykes from Next Gen Racing picked me up, uh, also the guys at uh, GT Fusion also, I think, were either participating in it or they alternatively were just watching. And they got in touch with me to say about, can you commentate uh, some of the lobbies in GT Fusion? Because you can imagine when they do racing, there's only six race weekends over the entire year. But when they do them, there's there can be upwards of 20 plus lobbies happening in parallel wow. over the course of a weekend. Yeah. And... They asked me to commentate, and uh, I remember, and well, and shout out to Pierre Chatura, who is the chief organizer of the series, and he puts in a huge amount of work behind the scenes. But when he and his colleagues reached out, uh, Zachariah Hamadi as well, they were sort of, can you commentate on this for us? We'll give you all the advertising and everything. And I had to be honest with them, because they were saying about all these different sort of um, overlays and things on those lines. I said to them, you do realize I just literally streamed directly from my PlayStation 4 to Twitch. I don't have a capture card or anything along those lines. And and I said to them, I'll happily commentate, but I can't put any of that on the screen because it just won't work. And they said, well, we can't have you commentate any of the big lobbies. Uh, I sort of the top three lobbies on the Sunday because we need the overlays. But we can, uh, what we can do is instead we can give you some of the lower lobbies. And what was quite funny was doing the, some of the sort of lower lobbies in terms of the splits was the fact that we had a lot of people sort of coming over towards those lower lobbies because of the commentary. And I'm not trying to brag. It's just how things worked out. And then on the Sunday, people were sort of, well, why, why haven't we got uh, Paul Walsh commentator on this as well? It's because I don't have the ability to do the overlays and all the sponsorship on there. But I'm very pleased to say now that I do have a capture card, I got one. Well, I got one two years ago. Just haven't had the chance to put everything in the same room. Now I do. It's all in this room here. Um, yeah. I will be back for GT Fusion this year, and I will be casting Lobby B on Sunday, so the second split. And well, it's going to be absolutely fantastic at the time ahead. But that's one. Of the, that's actually one of the the hardest stories that I've had in commentating. Um, so many series want have wanted on the PlayStation uh, on Grand Turismo Sport for me to have overlays. And I've had to say to them, I can't put it on because I don't have a capture card that I can connect. Yeah, and it's yeah. always been, well, sorry, we need our sponsors put on the screen. And I just think to myself, but shouldn't it be more, about, I know you've got sponsors, but shouldn't it be more about the commentary and actually getting people involved rather than whether you can put a badge up yeah. on the screen? I've never yeah. said that to them because I respect them and whatnot. I don't want yeah. to be rude. Uh, but that's perhaps one of been the, the most miserable parts is that I've had to wait two years to put a tiny black yeah, box definitely. next to a console. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? And you have your, your different boxes. I, I've got an HD 60S um, that I use for, for my uh, PlayStation and things. Um, and it seems to, to work reasonably well, but uh, but yeah, no, that's that's the thing, isn't it? It's but now you can you're kind of taking it to the next level, and and uh, and it all kind of goes through. Now, of course, your YouTube channel, which of course um, we have a link for in the description here for not just YouTube but your Twitch as well. 
So if you're wanting to subscribe, which I would strongly encourage you to do um, for Paul's channels, the links are there for you to click on to his channels and be able to subscribe there as well as our channel here. And of course, if you haven't already seen um, our channel and our history of and our catalog of interviews, we've got probably not but nearly 100 at least um, interviews now um, with lots of the, the main big streamers and characters from sim racing. Um, so you're well, more than welcome to go and check them all out. And if you like what you see, then please subscribe to the channel. That would be fantastic. Now, um, we have got another fan in the chat here from NXGN Ultra. Uh, nice to see a face to the voice of Paul. <laughs> Hello, uh, Kevin. That's uh, I think that's Kevin Smith next gen ultra from um from next gen racing and good evening to you, sir. I didn't know you hadn't seen my face already, but now you can. <laughs> yes, that's it. Now you can get a picture. Now you know who it is that you're working with. But, uh, but no, it's fantastic. So is there anything you would like to say to your community and to your friends here today um who are watching um as uh, as uh, as to your great community? Because isn't it because you've got over four thousand uh, I saw their subscribers, which is a great, a great success on YouTube. So many congratulations on, on managing to get get monetized, which so many of us are trying to do, but have failed so far to do, but we're, we're, we're getting there. Uh, so what would you like to say to your community? Oh, goodness. Me. Well, firstly, thank you, Hugh. It's, um, it's been a lot of work in the making, but um, what I would say to everyone is um, I'm very grateful to be where I am. Um, to all of you watching right now, and obviously uh, I'm going to give it, there's so many leagues I've commentated on, so many people I've met, I can't name all of them, but obviously to my best friends who I'll refer to by their online names rather than their real names because I don't want to embarrass them, but um, most, first and foremost, the Cypher Wolf, perhaps the the person who's been my rock in the darkest of days when things have gone wrong and has been there and supported me through everything uh, that I've gone through to get to where I am currently and is continuing to do so day and day and to where I absolutely Love you for everything you do, Cypher Wolf. And well, if you watch this, um, thank you for everything. Uh, also to Xeno Predator, Scorpion on Fire, Zeron, MB Hatred, and also Sweet Love. That's just named the, the closest people. Also made for racing, all the guys in the team there in SAS Racing, um, some fantastic people uh, through and through, all fantastic. But the again, I can't thank everyone uh, because mm. we, we'd be here for too long. But yeah. what yeah. I'd say to everyone is that just keep in mind at the end of the day, I, I do commentary in my spare time and I do it because I, I love it. I have to work a day job and I do that because I enjoy my job, but also because it pays the bills. But mm. in life, if there is something you enjoy, don't give up on it. Chase what your heart enjoys in life. And remember why you do things at the end of the day. Remind yourself that at the end of the day, you've got to have some fun in your life because if you don't yeah. have fun in your life, then you end up becoming old and miserable like me. Well, no, <laughs> but um, no, it, in all seriousness, it's sometimes it's about the little things that matter. And if you're ever looking to get into the world of commentating, don't do it because you want to get money. Don't do it because you want to turn it into a job one day. That is my goal. My long-term goal is one day to mm. be able to drop my day job and become uh, a commentator through and through. But even if I don't achieve that, the road I go on right now, and I don't know where it takes me, it's taken me to some wonderful places already. Um, I'm in it for the ride, and I love it. Yeah. And that's what I'd recommend to everyone. That's the message I'd say. Enjoy life. Enjoy what you do. And at the same time, if your heart's telling you to do something, go for it because that's how yeah. it all started for me literally because i said i can do a better job than that and i got told to prove it and then my heart said you know what? i really enjoyed doing it let's keep going yeah. and yeah. don't ever stop that pursuit yeah oh fantastic and definitely great advice there um for all budding commentators and also budding motorsport enthusiasts <laughs> uh because sim racing has given us great opportunities that we never thought we'd ever have before and and there's a little message there from P.O. School is saying, Paul, how do you do it? How do you remember every little detail while commentating? You must have a photographic memory. <laughs> oh, it's so the I think the best way. So you can't remember everything. That, that's the thing. I try. It's weird. So when I'm, I'm building up to commentate, if I've got a grid of, say, 20 drivers, I know I'm not going to remember every name and I know I'm not going to remember the pronunciation of every name. And uh, well, if the guys at Racing Team Astro who've competed in the Next Gen I Racing series are watching right now, they'll remember when I pronounced one member of their team, a chap name, named South African chap named Sean Skitter who I used to refer to as Sean Shoot and then Sean Scoot. And I kept butchering his name every, every time. You're, you're always going to get things wrong, but each time you, you come back, you remember something more. And that's the thing. Yeah. I, I'm it. I'm, I, I think I have an attention to detail that enables me to remember a lot of things by default. Yeah. But don't, 
be afraid that you're going to forget something. Or midway through commentary, if you forget who's leading the race, and I've done it multiple yeah. times, even now, a couple of nights ago, I made the mistake of using the saying that this person was in first place when they were clearly in second. Mistakes are going to happen. They do it in the real world. Murray Walker was the master of mistakes. He could make 101 mistakes, but nobody cared because he was Murray Walker, because he could keep you entertained. And if Murray can do that, then you can do it as well. That's the, that's the thing. It's remembering is about keep practicing it, keep doing it, and you will improve your memory over time. Yeah, yeah. It's just about keep on going at it. Yeah. That's the key thing. Yeah, it's when you have similar names. We've got a Mark Lewis and a Mike Mike Lawson. I don't know what's his, that shows you. I can't, the name's gone. But uh, <laughs> Emma, Emma was trying to make a point and it's gone. And trying to do, but when you have similar names mm -hmm. and all these names and you're trying to work out, it says who's leading the race. And quite often we've got it wrong. Uh, and I did say before in one of the in the in the build up, I ended up pronouncing uh, what I thought was a French name, and I thought it was actually a woman when it was actually a man. And the chap <laughs> came back to me on Discord. That's right, Mike Williams. That's what it is. Um, and uh, saying that uh, as, as it was very very funny um, being thought of being the highest lady in the in the in the race, other than Tia, um, it was actually a man. So that was <laughs> that was the issue. Uh, but no, it's something. Is that's the fun you can have. Uh, I suppose with commentary, you make a few mistakes here and there, um, but uh, everyone sees the good side of it, hopefully, um, when, it, when it all comes out there. But, uh, well, look, Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show tonight. Um, thank you very much for being a guest. Please stay on the line um, as, we, as we close up just now. But uh, I, now I, I wonder, have you heard our motto on the Car Sim and Race Driver show? Oh, go on. It is. Well, it, it used to be, to be fair, most of the time it has been this. It has been drive fast and try not to crash. And uh, <laughs> this is this is the one. And if you do, you might just win the race at the first corner. But now, now that I'm a bus driver, you see, I've made a, I've, I've, I've upgraded it. I've changed it. And it says drive fast, but drive your bus even faster. You know, so that's the one. <laughs> so I'm sure that's a responsible uh, way for public transport. But, uh, you know, so that's the thing. But no, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. And we wish you all the best for a fantastic year and career in commentating. Uh, we can Thank tell you. in your voice that you've got massive enthusiasm for racing, which is exactly what you need. Um, and I'm sure we'll see you get to even greater heights um, as what you've done already. But, uh, and we've really enjoyed having you on the show. This will come as a podcast. So if you want to listen to it in the car um, in the next uh, few days or so, I'll get that uh, sorted out. And it's recorded live. Um, so all, all the everything will be on it. There's nothing taken out of it. Um, so that's the thing. But uh, thank you very much to everyone who's been in the chat tonight and who's been watching and who'll be listening to this on the podcast in a few days' time. But uh, my special guest today is Paul Walsh. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Hugh, and thank you for having me. And thank you to everyone for the comments, the questions, and for tuning in. It's great to be here. It always is. Let's keep on pushing, guys. Fantastic. Take care, everyone. Drive fast, but drive your bus even faster. Bye, Joseph. <laughs>